So I want to spend a little time um, looking backwards. And Alita, you said just now that um, Eleanor is one of the most underappreciated people in history. And so um, let's appreciate her a little bit more this morning. Um, I know you spend a lot of time um, sort of teaching uh, sort of about the moment that Eleanor is working in, teaching about her drive for human rights. I'd love to help, um, to have you help us think about what is the context that Eleanor was working in um, and how it differs um, or does not differ from the context that we're working in today. Sure. Um, well, first, in the interest of full disclosure, I haven't been in the classroom for five years, so um, I, have, I have a research appointment and I'm working on different projects. but. I want you to envision a world that is profoundly dysfunctional, where we have 60 million refugees. That's more than 70 times the number that's leaving Syria now. I want you to think about um, 40 million Soviets dead, a half a million Americans dead, incredible dislocation in the United States, and, gen and two generations who have never seen capitalism work. And that capitalism is resurrected by defense spending, which is now de-escalating. It is a world on a jigsaw that's, that's literally with the teeth just spinning. With a, we don't know if another war is right around the corner, We've had the most horrible weapon the world has ever seen. You, we don't have to have YouTube. We don't have to have a gazillion Facebook channels. All you had to do was go to the movies to see newsreels of refugees, Holocaust survivors, disabled, shell-shocked military personnel, 1946, the Academy Award winner was the best years of our lives about a man who was a triple amputee from the war. What Eleanor Roosevelt was able to do in a way that I find, I don't know the adjective for it. I mean, right when I think I do, I see something else that is just horrific and I think, how could she see this? But Anne was talking, Anne did a beautiful job this morning, talking about her grandmother and courage and listening. And what Eleanor understood as a member of the Universal Declaration, as, as a member of the UN Committee, who's charged with um, negotiating the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, there are 18 nations, we don't agree on private property, we don't agree on God, we don't agree if there is a God, we don't understand gender, we don't understand marriage, we don't understand citizenship. The only thing that we agree on is by God we beat the Germans. And that the Holocaust and the horrors of war are ever present. So what she understood profoundly in a way that I find jaw-dropping courageous is that in spite of daily evidence of the shortcomings and the bigotry and the violence and the economic location that we really have a fundamental decision to make. And that is we can believe that the world is inherently evil, that war will continue to populate, that we will have racism and racial bigotry and xenophobia and discrimination against women for the rest of our lives, or we can have the courage to look ourselves in the mirror and take one step at a time. And what she was able to do, this woman with four years of school, I'm not talking college, postdoc, I'm talking four years of school, was to able to navigate a conversation <laughs> among those 18 nations to come together to a common understanding of what rights mean. And what she taught me, and then I'll shut up, is that <laughs> what she taught me was that it's not political and civil rights. It is not just public policy, which is what the American government <coughs> wanted her to do. She tells Truman and Lovett that she will resign from the committee 
if we do not take into consideration what Ann called safety and security, which are economic, social, and cultural rights, that they cannot be divided, and that the fundamental right is the right to food and shelter, because if you're not safe, you can't hope, you can't dream, democracy fades, <coughs> hatred rises, and violence escalates. And so her ability to keep the world focused on that in a time of extraordinary terror, to me, is just a jaw-dropping accomplishment. I'd love for each of you to weigh in on this. Um, I think what's interesting is that you know the human rights narrative and discussion um, in many ways has played out more in an international context than in a domestic context. Um, that's not to say there aren't advocates doing sure. human rights work in the United States, but it's not a phrase that we use as much in a domestic context. And um, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about the importance of thinking about the challenges we're up against right now as human rights violations and human rights issues and why that is important. Well, I want to tweak that a little bit in the sense of, Andrew, you're absolutely right that we are reluctant to do that now. But this is what Eleanor Roosevelt argued in 1948, 1949, all the way through, which is why the death threats on her escalated and the assassination attempts on her escalated. And she would ultimately have the largest FBI file in American history because of this. You know, and what she would argue is that we have no right to talk about human rights outside our country if we do not address human rights here. So she would say an attack on Jim Crow is a human rights violation. She came to, to um, to being articulate on women as human rights violations later, but in a, in a more muted way. And she famously says that unless these rights have meaning here, they have little meaning anywhere. And so our challenge now is to reinvigorate that conversation, which is where my students, human rights activists, the younger people in the audience who see us as part of, of, a, of a major nation, but also in an international context, can, can play a really great role. Because with human rights, it's not just about rights. It's not just about rules. It's about responsibility. It's about culture. It's about not leaning in, but standing up. And, um, and so I think now the United States is getting better on this. Um, the State Department, for its first time, has ordered human rights reports to be done on the United States. And so you will see um, data on sexual violence, racial discrimination, LGBT issues, discrimination and violence, and um, ig ignoring Native American populations show up on our own report. So it is becoming part of the policy but I would argue that for it to succeed, it has to become part of the culture to really push the policy forward. Does that make sense? Yes. Yes, sure. So I guess I would offer two responses. One would be, you know, we have to both understand the ways that rights frames and constitutional frames can be useful and also understand that threat, you know, that they very easily and often come to their limits. So if we think about um, the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act of 1964 and 65 respectively, um, they did laudable things in our society, but, you know, you also had activists on the ground, including Martin Luther King Jr. before he was assassinating, getting the pe poor people's campaign off the ground. So rights do good things in the world, but they also don't often give us an ethical frame for mm -hmm. how we should have a good society and how we should address and can address and attack forms of inequality. Um, so I think that's something to keep in mind. And I think, you know, there's also the case that rules and rights are unequally applied. They're mm -hmm. misapplied. Um, mm -hmm. They're misused, they're abused, and um, an example of this moving um, forward in time from Alita's great examples of the mid 20th century um, would be the, the sort of the whole ecology of criminalization that we face today. 
Um, and that is, you know, we think about the challenges that we have today, and there's a, a rights way of thinking about that, you know, like there are rules and there are laws and there's a criminal justice system and people should not break them, but we know that these are not applied evenly. And so the biggest concern for me with regards to gender equity and as someone who thinks about this as um, an African-American feminist and someone who's very committed to looking at the world through an intersectional lens is really this whole constellation of things. And so to add to um, Suzanne's story and Alita's story, we might think about a little girl here in New York City, 12 years old. She's maybe the great, great, great granddaughter of formerly enslaved people here in the United States. She's maybe um, the, the child of folks who have recently immigrated to the United States. She goes to a school every day that is effectively militarized, that has police um, seeing her in and out of school every day. And the mere presence of the police means that this little girl is far more likely to enter the criminal justice system. When militarization is our solution, um, then we don't have other options. So things that girls do in school, pull somebody's hair, push someone, call someone a name, become criminal activity. They don't, they're not resolved in the way we, things might have been resolved when we were in school. So that already puts girls of color in particular at risk for entering the criminal justice system. What does that also do? It means that girls of color, um, more than men of young boys of color, more than boys more generally in school, are twice as likely to be suspended or expelled from school. That means that they are at risk for having diminished educational opportunities. It means that they are risk, at risk for living in poverty. It means that they are at risk for entering romantic relationships that put them at um, um, an unequal, you know, an unequal balance. So relationships that are um, and that have physical abuse, sexual abuse. Um, they're more likely to be um, involved in sex trades and in sex trafficking. And so um, all of these things are pernicious issues. But what I, I guess I want to suggest is that um, it, there's a whole ecology here, there's a domino effect, and that our girls in, of color are particularly at acute risk, um, and that it's an, an urgent situation, and thinking about a rights discourse will only get us half way there, and in fact, thinking about a rights discourse might actually be part of the problem. Thank you. I'm going to read, oh, don't read. Yes, I'm going to read <laughs> because there are certain things I just don't want to keep in my mind. So I've never memorized these things, or, and some of them are recent. Uh, the bad news just keeps on coming, but um, sometimes we have, um, well, the percentages go up and down, but not by much. Uh, nationally, Native girls are 40 times more likely than white girls to be referred to a juvenile court for delinquency, 50 times more likely to be detained, and 20% more likely to be adjudicated. Violent crime, the violent crime rate among Native Americans is twice that of the general population. Native teenagers have the highest rate of suicide of any segment of American society. The highest rate of incarceration There's a boarding school legacy that, um, talking about mission schools and federal boarding schools, that parents were really not taught to be good parents. And what they generated mostly was, was trauma and general abuse.
Native girls and women see themselves written out of or wrongly about uh, in history. and are subjected to stereotypes that, that are really gone from most of the American landscape about girls and women generally. One is the squaw, of course, uh, meaning the, the ugly or docile or beaten down um, creature who walks ten paces behind the men um, or carries lots of firewood and other quasi-useful things uh, or the very beautiful Pocahontas kind of stereotype that, that some of you might open your fridge and see as the Indian butter maiden. Um, just, well, and generally, it, it, there's no one else in American society who gets caricatured in a way that Native people girls and boys, men and women, are in American sports. And even though we've eliminated two-thirds of the racist names and images from the American landscape in sports, uh, we still have over 900 to go. And we hear over and over and over again, you're not offended, you're honored. <laughs> well, no, we, we're, we're offended. Hey, no, you're honored. No, we're offended. Shut up. I mean, that's the conversation that goes on. And it's um, among grown-ups. And we're always asked, why are you clinging to these... Um, mascots. I mean, why, why, do you, why do you fight them as if they're real? And we say, well, why are you holding on to them and trying to keep them as if they're real? They're, they're real to us because they result in attitudes that result in actions that sometimes result in death. Uh, it's life and death for us. And we don't take it lightly. And they say, no, well, this is a good stereotype. This is showing you at your best. Well, what they mean is it's usually uh, an Indian male with braids, with feathers, and that's supposed to be all of us at our best, a warrior kind of image, um, really a wooden Indian, a cigar store kind of Indian. Uh, and that's not as our at our best. And the I talked to a, a woman from St. Bonaventure's in upstate New York one time, and she had been a player on the St. Bonaventure's basketball team, which I thought was great, and. Um, she said, we were so happy that the, the boys were called the Bonaventure Indians and we were the Bonaventure Squaws. But then one day they were approached by Seneca Nation clan mothers and a chief who talked with the girls on the team, who talked with their supervisors, the coaches, administrators, teachers, and said one reason we don't like that word is that 
it means in some of our native languages, vagina or genitalia for a woman. And that tells you in what high esteem the non-native people held the native woman. So the woman I was talking to said we were so mortified. We had no idea. We had taken it as a badge of honor and that we were somehow Indian princesses <laughs> and uh, whatever that meant. And we were happy. We were very proud of that. She said, we stopped using the, the team name that day. We never got any publicity. We, ne we didn't seek it. We didn't want it. And we didn't get it. And Oh, about 20 years later, the boys' teams dropped the Indian. But the girls' teams, all of them, dropped squaw instantaneously. And I thought that was to their credit. So I, you know, sing praises for St. Bonaventure's. <laughs> 